All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us. Uh, as Nima mentioned, I'm Adler Azamansuri, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery here at Penn State. Uh, feel free to reach out after this if you have any questions with TBIs or anything in neurosurgery or life in general. And um, this is uh, Taylor Santor. She's our excellent PA. Go ahead, Taylor, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Taylor. I'm one of the physician assistants with the department. Um, I graduated from Lock Haven in 2018, um, and I work very closely with Dr. Mansuri and get to assist on for, uh, first assist on cases. And uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. So the objectives for today's talk is to just give an overall uh, sense of the epidemiology of traumatic brain injuries and uh, just go over the initial history, physical assessment, and management of traumatic brain injuries. And on that note, we will present some of the evidence-based guidelines. The key point here is two things. Um, we don't have much in the form of good evidence-based medicine. And also the other thing you'll see as we present the cases that guidelines are just that, they're suggestions. They're not necessarily rigid uh, practice patterns and you'll see that. And then we'll finish off with three, what I hope are representative cases. So uh, Taylor's gonna take it away with the first uh, couple of objectives. All right, so the first thing we wanted to start by talking about is the TBI statistics. So there's approximately 2.5 million people who sustain TBIs annually in the U.S. Um, and 85% of these TBI-related deaths occur within the first two weeks, which tells you that the time within these first two weeks is super important as a clinician. And about 500,000 people have permanent neurological deficits. So this really does affect a large range of people. So the leading cause is actually falls, which I found very interesting when I started doing these TBI talks. Um, a lot of the elderly population that we see falling down in our practice, um, followed by motor vehicle accidents, which I think is what most people would actually predict, um, and then followed by unknown, um, and then assault. Um, so unknown can be anything from found down where the, it was an unwitnessed fall, um, but anything that we don't know. And then 16.5% are struck against. So uh, pedestrian struck by a car or anything like that along those lines. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about here, um, and Dr. Mansuri is gonna help too with these um, with imaging. Um, I know some of you guys are familiar with some of the imaging. So this is an axial cut. Um, this is a CT scan, um, and this is an acute subdural. So subdurals are actually venous bleeds, um, which is a good thing to keep in mind um, as compared to epidurals, which we'll go over here in a little bit. Um, and this pa patient has significant shift. Um, one thing that you can tell that this is acute is by how bright the blood is. Um, and we're going to compare that to chronic subdurals here coming up, and you can kind of see the difference. Um, right there is a chronic subdural. So you can tell the difference. Um, it's a little bit darker. Um, it still has a lot of shift. Um, it's also a venous bleed. Um, Dr. Mansuri, anything you want to add about how to differentiate between chronic and acute subdurals via imaging? Yeah, great. Uh, so exactly as you said, um, this pattern of bleeding, when you look on the axial cut, this crescent shape, it tells you it's a subdural hematoma. And the reason and the way we can differentiate this from an epidural hematoma is uh, that the epidural is a lens shape. And the reason why we have these patterns is because the blood in the subdural space is not really restricted by any adhesions of the dura to the brain or to the skull. So it's free to flow from anterior to posterior. And that's why you get this flowing pattern. Exactly as Taylor, Taylor said, the acute blood is bright, whereas chronic is dark. And you can see midline shift. What are we talking about? What are we talking about when we say midline shift? These are the uh, ventricles that hold the cerebral spinal fluid. And you can see there's a septation between them. This septum is supposed to be in, in the middle. And so this is, I would call this a very significant shift. And here with the chronic subdural. Uh, so we want this to be as interactive as possible. So um, these two, we've already talked about them and we kind of touched upon epidural. Um, why don't we ask the crowd, what pattern of bleeding this is. I'll give it five seconds if there's going to be anyone. Oh, I see we have in our chat. Someone said subarachnoid. So. Can anyone be more specific too, um, based on that pattern of that specific subarachnoid bleeding? I just want to jump in. We can't teach us different patterns yet, just so you guys know. 
All right, Usman, go ahead. You were going to say something? Uh, bleeding at the base of the brain. Mm -hmm, exactly. So these are, this is subarachnoid hemorrhage in the basal system. So just to clarify, um, all around the gyra of the brain, we have arachnoid membranes. So anything underneath the arachnoid membrane, but that's not brain or vessels, is the subarachnoid space. So when you have slivers of blood in various spaces that are not necessarily within the brain tissue itself, that's the subarachnoid space. It's not in the ventricles, it's not in the brain tissue, and it's not underneath the dura, it's in the subarachnoid space. And the way Osman knows these are the basal cisterns, basically you have the brain stem here and you have the major vessels right in the center, the circle of Willis. So this blood has expanded in this pattern. And there's a reason why this is important because it is different from this pattern of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Usman, you wanna run with that and tell us why this, these two subarachnoid hemorrhages are different? This is like bonus points. <laughs> so one is, uh, so I get one is crossing mid. You're cutting out there a little bit, but uh, you're, you're right. So the one to bleed in the basal cisterns, the volume of it, the pattern and of obviously, it. So, uh, depending on where it's coming from, I would imagine the one on the left would be fine. Yeah, sorry, you're cutting out. Um, so the one on the left-hand side, this is in the basal cisterns, it's quite central, it's associated with the major vessels. Um, so that is usually with an aneurysmal pattern of aneurysmal rupture pattern of hemorrhage. And this one is more, you know, on unilateral, it's not associated with the major vessel. Um, this is most likely traumatic, but um, a little bit outside the scope of this introductory lecture, but there are multiple different causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But I think we've covered the most common one, which is traumatic, that we see hundreds of in our day-to-day -day call shift. And this one is the aneurysmal one, which is the most lethal, the cause of greatest mortality and mor morbidity. And aneurysmal rupture, in general, broadly speaking, the statistics are a third of the patients, unfortunately, pass away in the field, like uh, without even making it to the hospital. Um, a third have major disabilities, and a third do actually okay. Another thing I want to point out on this left-hand subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, this is the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, and it is relatively enlarged. Um, and that tells you perhaps this patient has early hydrocephaly, just to point that out there. And finally, what's this one? Taylor, you want to tell us about this one? Um, I just wanted to go back real quick to the epidural and 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 say one more thing too about the epidural too while I'm thinking about it. Um, I had mentioned earlier that the subdurals were um, from arterial bleeds, and I wanted to go back at, or I'm sorry, from venous bleeds. Uh, and epidurals are from arterial bleeds, the most common being the middle meningeal artery. And one thing that may pop up, um, especially if there's any physician assistants here taking the boards, um, is there's this a lucid period that they talk about where people who have epidurals, um, particularly young people, um, they get a head injury, they're up, they're talking and everything, and then all of a sudden they crump um, and they become unconscious. Um, and this lucid period, um, along with the lens-shaped uh, imaging on the CT scan, um, those are all key things to think about when you think about epidurals to kind of um, decipher between them and subdurals. So, mm -hmm. Excellent point. And the reason why you have the initial, so so first you take the hit, there's been a hit to the head, you kind of lose consciousness, but then you get back to it because you recover from the initial hit. Meanwhile, there's active bleeding building up. And the reason why this is problematic is because it's arterial blood, there's nothing tamponading it to stop the pressure and therefore stop the bleeding. So after a while, the brain shifts over and that's why you lose consciousness. And that's why it's such an emergency. As are acute subdural hematomas, because it's active bleeding and it's the brain actively being pushed over, um, the brain doesn't have time to compensate. And we'll get to that later in the lecture with the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. The brain can't compensate and therefore patients are quite sick and, sick and the mortality is high. Whereas a chronic subdural hematoma, this has been building up very slowly. So the brain kind of has the chance to accommodate to it. So patients present with more slowly developing symptoms. Finally, these are contusions. Again, these two are the most common patterns we see with traumatic bleed. This is a bump in front of the, a bump to the skull. 
the areas where we see this kind of pattern of bleeding most commonly is where the brain is near the bone. So the brain kind of rubs against the bone and that's why you get these contusions. And the thing you gotta be careful about these in the first, when the patient first presents, they may be small, but they may really expand fast and the patient may run into trouble. So you wanna repeat a scan soon after the first one to make sure they're not expanding. That's a great, that's an excellent point. That's a point I was gonna to make too. Some of them will really blossom. Yeah, so we typically, depending on how old the patient is and if they've been on any blood thinners or the volume of the initial bleed, we ask for a repeat scan in about four to six hours um, if we're not going to urgently intervene on them, but we're kind of still worried. So yeah. um, getting into more of the assessment. Um, so this is super important. Like we talked about earlier, a lot of the um, deaths that occur with, from TBIs happen within the first two weeks. So everything that you're doing while the patient's in the hospital is super important. Um, so when a patient first comes in, what kind of assessment as, as a medical student or a PA student or a resident are you going to be expected to get? The first thing is obtaining a set of vitals, um, ABCs, um, always key to keep reassessing very often um, because these patients can change their status quick. Um, and determining a GCS early and often. So I'm assuming most of you are familiar with a GCS, but that is probably one of the most important things going into any neurosurgery specialty or rotation that you can know. Um, so we can go over that a little bit more in detail, um, but also checking pupils. So size, reactivity, and symmetry. Um, so what nerves, cranial nerves, does this involve when you're checking the pupils of patients? In on two, out on three. Excellent, excellent. Excellent, yes. Awesome. Um, so just, just to briefly- I just wanted to point out what the mnemonics are. I mean, the short form is the ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. And GCS is the Glasgow Coma Scale. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and ABCs, uh, as Dr. Manseri said, sorry, I should have went into the specifics of that, um, are super important in trauma. Um, and any of you who do a trauma rotation will go over those often. So just to go over the Glasgow Coma Score a little bit, the GCS. So um, eyes are obviously graded on a scale of one to uh, four. Motor responses are on one to six. Um, and then verbal are one to five. And we're gonna go over this a little bit more in depth and talk about what each one means um, here in the next slide. So noxious central stimulation, so doing a sternal rub. Um, one thing I want to point out is when we talk about this, um, central stimulation on TBI patients is so important. It's so important that it's not peripheral. Um, and the reason why this is so important is because peripheral, like squeezing their finger, um, like their nail bed or, or those types of things, which you will sometimes see um, bedside nurses do in the ICU, um, is that can actually be a spinal reflex. And it doesn't actually coordinate um, whether their brain is sensation and motor, processing sensation and motor. So it's super, super important that you have this noxious centralized stimuli, such as the sternal rub, rather than doing something such as pinching the nail bed. Um, just something to really keep in mind. Um, and then checking brainstem reflexes. So cough and gag. Um, a lot of times you can do this right at the bedside um, if the patient's intubated by using the ET tube to check their cough and gag, um, and then corneal as well. Um, so what cranial nerves are these? Let's talk about cough and gag first. Which cranial nerves does that entail? Exactly, nine and 10. I see nine and 10 from a couple people. Yep. So that tests nine and 10. So what's actually pretty cool is that I um, found very interesting when I got into trauma and neurosurgery is you can test a lot of the cranial nerves, even on a patient that's intubated um, and even in a coma, um, you can really, really test. Um, what about corneal? Perfect. Yep. Awesome. Great job, guys. So just to read the chat for whoever's watching later. Um, uh, the response was cranial nerve nine and 10 for a cough and gag and cranial five brings the sensation in and cranial seven is the motor arm of the reflex. Actually. All right, next slide. So as promised, we're going to talk a little bit more about this glass calcoma score. Um, I can't express enough how important this is for all of you guys to have memorized. Um, and it will really impress your preceptors if you're able to calculate it off the top of your head once you get into your rotations and everything. 
Um, so motor is the best prognostic indicator. And what you do when you, when you do a GCS is you take the best motor score. So um, say you have a patient who's paralyzed on one side, say it's a stroke patient, um, but on the other side, they can follow commands. They can give you a thumbs up. They can um, show you two fingers. You take that as following commands on their best side, even though their one side is paralyzed. Does that make sense to everybody that you take the best motor score? And most of the literature says around a GCS score of about eight is when you start thinking about intubation. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is um, one thing that people talk about a lot is posturing um, when it comes to GCS score. Um, so posturing. So it, this can be decorticate posturing, which is known as flexor posturing. Um, and this is when you have a lesion that's higher in the red nucleus. Um, and then we have what's called decerebrate, which is extension response to pain, extensor posturing. And this is damage in the pons and the medulla. So it's a little bit more serious than the, and has a worse prognosis as compared to decorticate, which again is the flexion response to pain. Um, it usually um, means impending herniation. Mm -hmm. And one to... more, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The last thing I wanted to say too about this as far as, um, localizing is. So I was giving a talk for the Hershey medical students. Um, and one thing they asked me about is localizing. Um, so I really wanted to explain to everybody kind of what the literature describes as localizing. It's when you cross the midline and try and remove a stimuli because it entails both sensation and motor because you can feel the stimulus and then you have the motor response in your brain to try and remove that stimuli across um, midline. So that's important to know about localization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just wanted to add a couple of key points. First of all, yes, you impress your preceptor, but also um, it, it helps when you're taking call or doing a rotation and you're doing it with the resident or the uh, neurosurgeon on call to really be able to summarize the extent of the injury in basically one word, right? By giving them GCS. And when you document and when you're reporting, you do give the best GCS, but it's important to also report and document that the contralateral side is doing this. The right side, for example, they're obeying, but on the left side, they're not moving it or there's a known history of stroke. So it's not a shock when two hours later, someone else assesses the patient and they're completely not moving the other side. And when you're writing your GCS score, when you write, uh, when you want to indicate the person has a no verbal response, I think it's also important to qualify that. So V1 because they're just not talking or is a V1 because they have an ET tube in there. So if that's the case, you put V1T to indicate that there's a tube in there or if the patient has a known history of a stroke that causes an aphasia, I would write that in my notes that this V1 is baseline. It's not new from the injury. So these are all important things. So the, the key thing to look at your exam is that Someone else will be referring to this in a couple of hours, couple of days to see if the patient has experienced any change. So you want to be as comprehensive and as succinct as possible. So these are the key things to write in your exam as well. So one thing when you're assessing the patient that you want to look for is external signs of trauma, which sounds obvious, but there's some specific to neurosurgery. So you want to be looking for a CSF leak. Um, look for any clear fluid from the nose, from the ears, or in the back of the throat. Um, if the patient is able to talk, you can ask if they have a salty taste in their mouth um, as well. Um, you want to look for any abrasions or lacerations as well. Does anybody know um, the picture on the left behind the ear, um, what that's called? There's a specific name for what that is. Yep, battle sign. And what is that associated typically with? Correct. Yeah. So it's called um, a basal. It's associated with a basal uh, skull fracture. And for those of you who are listening in, um, it, it's a um, battle sign. And then the picture on the right, um, does anybody know what that's called? Yes, raccoon eyes. And again, that's also associated with the basal skull fracture as well. So assessment. So again, as we talked about, um, you want to continue to reassessing throughout the trauma resuscitation because GCS, um, mental status, everything can change so much throughout the exam. So you want to keep reassessing. And you also want to keep in mind when you're assessing any patient with a TBI, 
they may have medications or illicit drugs or alcohol that may be on board that may actually um, mask your examination findings. So you always wanna be aware of what else is going on when you're examining a patient or could be going on. I was gonna add to this, that's a very good point. So for example, if the patient has very large pupils and their systolic is 200, uh, I wouldn't rush to call that that they're bilaterally blown pupils. Maybe they have just used cocaine or maybe they just came out of the ophthalmologist and they had their eyes dilated. So it's very important to note that. And um, just going back to the CSF leak, uh, oftentimes in the setting of trauma, there's, for example, blood coming out of the ear too. And the way you can distinguish whether there is CSF in that blood, you uh, let that drop uh, go on a white uh, gauze and you look for a ring sign, a halo sign, basically, because um, as the fluid migrates out of the, from the center, the red blood cells are heavier, so they stay around the center, whereas the CSF fluid kind of can go further. So you see a clear halo around the red spot. So that may be indicative of a CSF leak there. So the next thing we wanted to talk to you guys about a little bit is the brain trauma foundation guidelines. As, Man as Dr. Mansuri um, discussed with everybody earlier, um, there's not a ton of um, data to support. It's all kind of guidelines um, at this time for neurosurgery. And there's actually only one level one criteria, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. So um, as I said earlier, there's level one, there's level 2A, and there's level 2 um, B. And these are recommendations based on the quality of evidence behind the um, recommendations that are being made. Yeah. So a randomized control trial, ideally well-conducted, large sample size, that's level one. But any other prospective study, for example, and or, the, or a good randomized trial, but there was some bias associated with it, that's level 2A. And anything below that is level 2B and level 3. Um, so for level two, um, one of the guidelines for ICP monitors is a GCS of less than or equal to eight after resuscitation and an abnormal head CT in a salvageable patient um, gets an ICP monitor, as well as an abnormal head CT in one that reveals hematomas, contusion, swelling, herniation, or compressed basal cisterns. Um, so Dr. Mansuri, do you want to talk a little bit about how you utilize um, these guidelines for ICP monitors in your practice? Absolutely. Very good question. So first of all, we have a question from the audience. Uh, why is it difficult to get level one evidence? And I think you answered your own question because in the setting of a severe traumatic brain injury, it's really hard to justify randomizing patients to one treatment or another. So we just go with what we've been taught and what the most common practice is, et cetera. It's really hard, as you said, to randomize. So that's why we don't have good level one evidence. Um, so these guidelines are very complicated. So GCS less, of, less than eight, uh, there can be a multitude of reasons. Um, patient could be having a seizure, you know, blood pressure could be off, et cetera. So, and you know, the ICP monitor, which is monitoring of the intracranial pressure, there's a lot of debate back and forth about it because ultimately what it is, you either insert, um, there's many ways of doing it, but you either insert an external ventricular drain into the ventricles, and the advantage of that is it gives a general centralized idea of the intracranial pressure, and it allows you to drain off some cerebrospinal fluid. And again, we'll get to that with the Mondo Kelly hypothesis. Um, if the pressure is high, you can drain off some spinal fluid to uh, alleviate it. And all, but most places they call this thing called a bolt, and it's a tiny catheter that goes into the brain about two and a half centimeters, and it all has to do okay. Which side are you putting it on, on the normal side or the abnormal side? Is it close to a hemorrhage or away from the hemorrhage? So there's a lot of nuances associated with that and the intracranial pressure can go up if the patient's coughing if they're suffering pain. So well, one thing you do wanna avoid when you put the monitor in is to avoid just blindly chasing the number. You really wanna be well aware of the entirety of the patient, what's been going on, have they just got a lot of central rubs and that's why their ICP is high. So. That's why it's not a level one recommendation that every patient with a GCS-8 and an abnormal CT should get an ICP monitor. Um, go ahead, Taylor, with the level three. Yeah, so level three is a GCS of less than eight after resuscitation and a normal head CT if two of the following are present and want a mission. So age greater than 40, um, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing, and a systolic less than 90. So systolic less than 90, and you're worried about the brain getting, something's happening and the brain's not getting enough perfusion. So you want to make sure the intracranial pressure is not too high. 
So whatever pressure is coming from the heart can make it into the brain cells and perfuse them. Um, age is another factor. And as we talked about posturing, the motor score of the GCS is the most prognostic. So if they're having posturing, that means this person probably is having a, one of the factors that support prognosis. You want to monitor them closely to make sure they don't go further down the bad path. So level 2B is treating an ICP above 22 is recommended because values above this level are associated with increased mortality. And then level three is a combination of ICP values, clinical and brain CT findings um, are used to help make the um, management decision. So basically kind of what that is saying a little bit is you can't just base it on one value. You have to look at the entire clinical picture, um, what, which I think is kind of what all these guidelines sort of entail is looking at the entire clinical picture and not just focusing in on one value. Yeah. And just to give you an idea about intracranial pressure, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's this fluctuates a lot. When you're uh, sitting up, it's probably lower than when you're lying down because when you're sitting up, uh, venous blood can flow out of your cranium. Whereas when you're lying down, the pressure can build up. But usually it's in the five to 10, 15 range. If you're, for whatever reason, you're straining when you cough or sneeze, that can go up. Uh, but usually it doesn't go higher than 20. So 20 to 25. So usually what we say, um, incorporating that level three recommendation down there is if the pressure is greater than 20 for a continuous period uh, without, in, in the absence of any noxious stimuli or active pain, then we should treat that. And the treatments are, are, are usually um, medication, head of bed elevation, medication to uh, increase uh, fluid, the uh, urine output to basically drain off fluid, um, uh, manage the pain, um, and ultimately, if none of that is successful, surgery may be indicated. Which is a great point, too, that Dr. Mansuri made, too, um, for managing ICP. Keeping the head of bed 30 degrees is something we do for most of our patients. Um, and obviously, if they have a spinal cord injury, sometimes we have to use Trendelenburg or uh, reverse Trendelenburg. Um, but that's another trick that we use to help keep the ICP down. And that's a balance. So if you're zero degrees, you're putting a lot of pressure on the brain because the venous flow is uh, not as high as it can be. But if you go greater than 30 degrees, you can't really put them upright because then you have trouble of arterial perfusion to the brain. So it's that fine balance. Right. So um, this is the Mon Monroe Kelly uh, hypothesis. Um, so I actually took this picture from my ATLS book because I think it does the best um, explanation overall of what the Monroe Kelly doctrine is. So this is basically the sum of the volume of the brain is made up of brain, CSF, and blood. Um, and obviously if there's an increase in one, there must be a decrease in the other. And obviously your brain's gonna stay the same size throughout it. So what does this exactly mean? So um, in the first one, so you have venous blood, arterial blood, the brain, and CSF. They all exist in a normal state. Your ICP is normal. Um, so what happens when one gets bigger? So now you added this mass, um, which is going to push on everything else. Obviously, you're going to have the CSF is going to have to go somewhere um, because the brain stays the same size and the mass is putting more pressure. So for a little while, the brain can compensate. You can drain off more CSF. Um, you can lose. You can have more blood drained off. Um, and you can compensate this for a little while, but it gets to a point because the, the head and the skull is a fixed size as well as the brain, where once that mass gets so large, we can no longer compensate. So now um, it's putting too much pressure on the brain and pushing off too much CSF um, as it shows in the third picture. And now your ICP is going to have to go up. Um, so I think um, this picture does a really excellent for anyone who's a visual learner of showing kind of what we're discussing in this. And here's the word version of it. And kind of like I talked about, the brain is the least compressible, which would make sense to everyone. You can't change the size of your brain. That's a fixed state. Um, you have a fixed volume because your skull, you know, is a fixed size. Um, and blood flow is auto-regulated. So it works within the ce cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, and CPP, which is your cerebral perfusion pressure, is your mean arterial pressure or your MAP minus your ICP. And mean arterial pressure, um, I believe it's two-thirds of the systolic blood pressure plus one-third of the diastolic blood pressure. And uh, CPP of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, you need to intervene. So that's why it's helpful to have ICP monitor. You already have the blood pressure on the monitor from the cuff or the arterial line. So you can use that to calculate the CPP. 
Um, so ventilation. So um, one thing is that normal ventilation is the goal, except uh, cerebral herniation may cause transient hyperventilation. So this is important to think about. Um, just always remember, unless the patient has um, is about to herniate, uh, normal ventilation is always the goal because there's level B, 2B evidence that shows prolonged prof prophylactic hyperventilation um, is not recommended. Um, so this is really important to think about because um, low CO2 causes, causes low cerebral blood flow and it's a potent vasoconstrictor which can cause ischemia, which is why it's so important to have a CO2 level between 35 and 45. In contrary, high CO2 level is a potent vasodilator um, and vasodilation during um, when CO2 is high can then cause an increase in ICP. So that's why normal ventilation is always the goal and you don't want um, for um, hyperventilation for any long periods of time other than when herniation is um, impending. Yeah, and the, the reason for that is uh, your brain is already compromised. So if you are going to decrease the CO2, you cause vasoconstriction. So whatever trickle of blood flow the compromised brain was getting, that also gets diminished. And you can see on this yellow curve beyond a uh, particular level of uh, CO2. This is a very difficult one to figure out. I, honestly, I had the most difficulty with this, but uh, below some threshold of CO2 pressure, your brain oxygen can go down too. So that's why it's harmful. Typically, um, we look at the PaCO2, um, use a mo monitor um, uh, and at the end of the endotracheal tube. And you go to this level of 25 millimeters or so, usually on your way to the OR, when you're about to do something for the patient, you can't keep it prolonged. And usually otherwise, we say 30 to 35, almost physiologic range is ideal on the lower end of it. So uh, systolic blood pressure. So I know we talked earlier about vital signs being important. Um, systolic blood pressure is an important thing to keep in mind in, with TBIs at all times. Um, there's insufficient evidence to make any level one or two recommendations, but a level three recommendation is that the systolic blood pressure should be at 100 or greater for patients 50 to 69 years old, and then greater than 110 or above for patients 15 to 49 or over 70 years old. So this is super important to keep in mind. Um, you also um, don't want it to get too low, but you also don't want it to get too high, which is another discussion. Um, but one episode of hypotension has been actually um, associated in the studies with an increased mortality rate. So this is super important. Um, and as I stated earlier, there's actually only one level one recommendation in the entire brain trauma guidelines. Um, and this is it. Use of steroids is not recommended for improving the outcome or reducing ICP. High dose methyl methylprednisone is associated with increased mortality and is actually contraindicated. So basically, this is a big fancy way of saying that steroids are contraindicated in TBI patients to treat the actual TBI itself. And this is one that we actually did have randomized data on. All right, any questions before we move on to cases? Excellent. Okay, so the first case, um, you have a 28 year old male who was doing some work around his house uh, on the second floor and fell off the ladder onto the first floor. When he's brought to the trauma bay, um, his vitals are stable, but his GCS, and I'm gonna test somebody on this, um, you're told by your uh, resident that the eyes are not opening to pain. So despite central pain, the eyes are not opening. The patient is localizing to central pain on the left side, but withdrawing to pain on the right side. They're intubated. So what's that GCS? Uh, so since they're intubated, that's V1T. Mm -hmm. uh, eyes not opening to pain. I, I think that's a zero or a one. And we don't then, have And then the... Uh, localizing pain to the left and withdrawing to pain on the right. So that would be going with the higher one, localizing pain on the left. That's a, I, I don't know what the score is for that. Five. Five. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So we don't have, for any individual category, we can't go lower than one. So E1. Okay. Um, 
localizing, I agree with you, you go with the best one. Localizing is the best one. So that's uh, M5. And then, as you said, patient is V1T. So that is written as a 7T. This brings up one really good point, too, that we didn't talk about when we talked about the Glasgow Coma score. Um, can anyone answer what the lowest GCS score possible is? Correct. Everyone's three. saying three. So just to be clear, the lowest you can have in any category is one. You'll never have a zero. So the lowest score that you can ever have on any GCS, even a patient in a complete coma doing nothing, is three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you lose a lot of credibility if you say GCS one or two. <laughs> and uh, in, in this case, the patient was uh, pupils equal and reactive, and the brainstem reflexes were all present. So as you're hearing this story, okay, this person clearly has had an injury to the brain. Um, you try to find out whether there was any drugs or seizure activity, um, but there's clearly a, focal, a, fo a localizing sign. And they're localizing on the left, but it's, the motor exam is worse on the right. So there's probably something going on at least on the left side of the brain. And um, people's are equal, brainstems are, uh, brainstem reflexes are intact. So at least for now, there's no harm through compression on the brainstem. There's no uncle herniation pinching on the third nerve affecting the pupillary reflex. So the first thing you do after stabilizing the patient and um, would you intubate this patient? Ah, they're already intubated. But GCS7, you mm -hmm. intubate them. After you've uh, stabilized them, you go to get a, your image. You want to get a stat CT scan. Um, who would want to tell me what they see on the left side? I guess I'll bring it up. So is it an epidural or a subdural? Think about Sub the shape that we talked about. Subdural. Excellent. Is it acute or chronic? Yep. Okay, I have votes for acute and chronic. It's acute because it's bright. You're, uh, whoever said chronic, it, it's, it's a little bit less obvious than the first pictures we showed, but um, the chronic ones are really dark. And the other hint to take is considering how thin of a rim of a, blood, a bleed it is and compared to how much shift, shift they have, it's, you know, if this was chronic, it oftentimes would not cause this much shift, but usually the acute bleed causes a lot of shift for its own volume. So tight brain, young gentleman, um, pretty bad exam, to be honest, no reported seizure activity. So you're kind of worried already. In the young brain, you're much, much more worried because they really have, don't, don't have much more room to compensate. For bonus points, what am I trying to show in this bone window here? I guess it's really difficult because it's the base of the skull, but there's a fracture here and here as well. And that's important as I'll show with the next series of slides, but there's a major draining venous sinus that runs along this bone. And um, so transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, jugular vein, and this drains out into the neck. And that is important as I'll show. So he was taken urgently to the operating room for a left-sided hemicraniectomy. You can see the bone is missing. So with the hemicraniectomy, you wanna be as large as possible because you wanna give the brain that will inevitably expand in the next few minutes to hours as much room to swell out rather than swelling in and damaging other structures. And you want to also make sure it's large enough for another reason, because the motor cortex ends up being somewhere here. So if your bone lip is um, too far front, as the brain herniates out, it pinches the brain right on the motor cortex. So you actually cause more deficit. So you want to be as wide as possible. Typically, we say 12 to 15 centimeters in the widest diameter. So a couple of things to note here is that, first of all, the brain has really expanded out. Um, so it needed that extra room. Um, there's some contusions developing at the site of the injury. So we initially had not seen them, but they were developing. So this was another good reason to decompress the brain. Mm -hmm. But also you can see a lens-shaped bleed here. And this can get tricky because lens shape, we automatically think epidural hematoma. And this is epidural, but this was from the sinus bleeder. So that fracture lower down, nicked the vein, and put pressure on uh, and uh, cause venous bleeding. And that's slowly built up. So the reason why this is important because you know you worry about this pattern of the bleed, should I go and decompress this one too? But you know the brain is already recovering from this operation. How do you position them, et cetera? And venous blood, as I said, especially when it's outside the dura, 
it's a slower, lower pressure bleed. So you hope you give it a chance to tamponade, especially if the patient's not demonstrating any deficits from it. So for this patient, their left-sided motor exam did not change. I had an ICP monitor in there. The ICP did not change and the vitals were stable. So we opted to monitor him closely. And over the next couple of days, the brain expanded out even more. And so again, emphasizing how much that craniectomy was necessary. And this is very scary, the pattern of expansion of this clot, it got even bigger. But again, the vitals were stable and this was a fine line. We had a detailed discussion with the family that we would watch all the vitals and the numbers and the exam and basically go hour by hour. And then ultimately he got through that and made it out to day 20. You can see the brain was still expanded. Most of the blood had resolved because you know anywhere in your body that you injure, eventually the blood uh, clot do resolve. And importantly, have a look here. You can see that that thick clot was resolving as well. It stopped causing pressure on the brain and resolved. And already this fracture was healing by itself. So another reason to not intervene is because the venous sinuses are carry a high volume of blood. And if this bleed is tamponading it, stopping the bleeding, you go in there and take off this bone, you're gonna promote further bleeding. So it can be potentially life-threatening. So this was one of those situations where you're between a rock and a hard place. And uh, thankfully in this case, the decision worked out. At two months out, the patient has gone to rehab. He's talking a little bit more. He's starting to walk independently. Um, the brain is sinking back in and that clot on that side is completely gone. A couple of things to note, uh, if you let this go long enough, the brain really concaves in and that's because the atmospheric pressure outside becomes higher than the intracranial pressure and that can be harmful. So it's called uh, the syndrome of the trephine. So the trephine was the craniotomy back in the day. So they would actually have uh, right-sided weakness and speech deficits, et cetera, because the brain is actually being compressed. So now would be a good time to consider putting the bone flap back because the brain is not tight anymore. Now they're actually going the other way. So what we did, because his skull was actually shattered, we got a 3D printed, custom printed implant and uh, put it back. And this is what it looks like at three months out. And this gentleman is, um, you know, able to go back on the laptop and do a lot of these cognitive games and not back to work yet, but talking better, walking independently. So hopefully going in the right direction. He looks really great. He's, he's really came a long way. And yeah, it's, it's been really, really cool to see. Yeah, a lot of neurosurgery is not necessarily when to operate, but when to not operate. Any questions on that case? I had a quick question. Um, thank you so much for walking through that case. It was really cool. Um, when you are in that situation where you said that you're in, you know, quote, a rock and a hard place, um, who do you, do you have somebody that like a mentor or something that you uh, consult or how do you typically get through those, those decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. Always. The answer to that is always, because especially as we've been trying to say with the first few slides, there is no evidence and we try to follow our training, but also you keep a repository of trusted mentors that when you're whenever you're stuck um, you bounce ideas off your mentors your good colleagues close colleagues and that's the beauty of our practice um, you know we're very close and we bounce ideas off of each other and um, you usually you know you think you're on the right track but there's one factor that you hadn't considered etc and sometimes you just need that vote of confidence so yes you always have to you know there's no place for ego in this sort of a job so you think you're making the right decision, but it's always important to just ask other people to, because ultimately it's a patient's life that's at stake. We have a question from the chat. Oh, the comment, thank you. <laughs> All right, next case. 70 year old gentleman, the ER doctor calls you. Um, they have this patient with several day history of progressively worsening balance and speech, okay? They're on aspirin, great. Aspirin's an antiplatelet agent and it's the enemy of neurosurgery. <laughs> they have a history of chronic alcohol use, but hey, the DCS is 15. And on our exam, the patient has a left pronator drift. And um, I'll get to that. So 
basically pronator drift, you ask the patient to stick up their arms out, extend them all the way out and palms up facing the ceiling and they close their eyes. So if there's any subtle weakness from the cortex down to the arms, um, the hands have a tendency to pronate, turn inward. So, and if your eyes are open and the weakness is only subtle, the eyes can catch that and they adjust for it. But when you ask them to close their eyes or when you cover their eyes, if there's a subtle deficit, um, their palm will turn. And this patient had a left pronator drift. So um, where am I suspecting, which side am I suspecting a problem, left or right on the brain? We have right, right, right. Okay, great. Good, right side of the brain controls the left side, great. So aspirin, you get worried because it thins the blood. And if we have time to wait in neurosurgery, we usually wait at least seven days for the aspirin to um, lose its effect on the platelets. Um, worsening balance uh, is such a broad differential diagnosis. And hopefully in the future, we can get to the spinal cord stuff. And Taylor has had a great presentation in the past on the cerebellum. Um, but when he's got a speech problem, you start wondering. Uh, speech, again, is complicated too. You have the motor and sensory understanding of speech, but also sometimes when people tell you the patient can't speak, their tongue isn't turning or they have a facial droop. So it's important to clarify that. History of chronic alcohol use. So obviously the patient, you worry about liver cirrhosis, therefore they have difficulty making clotting factors, but also chronic alcohol can cause brain atrophy. CT scan shows this. Um, impressive. See, the patient has a GCS 15. Who wants to tackle this one? Um, is this a subdural or epidural? Chronic subdural, chronic subdural. Excellent. Good. And we know it's chronic because it's darker. And this is the axial cut. This is the coronal cut. You can see causing, a, and as you're reporting to your attending or your resident, causing significant brain compression, midline shift, um, it's got a septation. And, you know, we talked about bright is acute. So there's these potentially acute elements to it and there's septations in it. But yeah, everybody who answered right chronic subdural was absolutely right. So this gentleman, because of his symptoms, um, um, we opted to not really wait for the aspirin to wash out of the system. It's an impressive scan. We had a long conversation about the risk of re-bleeding uh, while on the aspirin, and it just happens a lot in chronic subdural hematoma. Um, the one key thing, an acute subdural hematoma, like any other acute blood, the blood is clotted and it's thick. Whereas the chronic subdural hematoma, especially when they appear like this, it's very liquidy. As the blood be becomes chronic, it liquefies, but in some people it doesn't absorb. The brain is atrophied or whatever the cause is. The brain is not able to absorb that. In neurosurgery, chronic is easier, chronic subdural is easier to manage because you can get it through a simple burr hole. You make the burr hole and over the thickest area of the clot and you try to get as much of it out as possible. And, and then you pass a drain into subdural space to drain off the rest of it. So for example, if I were to put a burr hole up here, uh, I would pass the drain back here and over the next 24 hours or so, it would capture uh, it would drain whatever's left in there. So there's no need to try to keep going after it. And that's what, exactly what we did in this gentleman. And uh, most of day one, beautiful scan, if I may say so myself. Uh, just a thin <laughs> rim of uh, blood right there. And the rest is kind of um, consistent with CSF on the other side. So he did have brain atrophy. Um, and you can still see there's some compression, but with time, this part of the brain should start looking like that. Uh, when you three, do can you, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, when you, cons uh, when you consent for this sort of uh, operation, you quote about a 10, 20% chance of rebleeding or incomplete resolution of the clot. It's not always necessarily clinically significant. Sorry, Taylor, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, can you talk about some of the reasons why you would watch uh, these chronic subdurals? And, and that was basically what I was alluding to, the, the chance of rebleeding and seizures, just going over some of the reasons why you may choose non-surgical intervention for some of our chronic subdurals as well. Absolutely. So with any surgery, there is a fixed-ish uh, uh, amount of risk, and then there's the benefits. So you always try to, you, if you're going to offer surgery, the benefits better outweigh the risks. So, you know, if you add that the patient's been on aspirin and they're actively seizing and, you know, they have poor respiratory status and, you know, they've had multiple uh, bypasses in the past, heart bypasses, 
then their risk keeps going up and up and up. And the benefit that you're trying to get is, you know, relieve the brain pressure. So if they're comatose and they have that scan, the benefit of decompressing that is probably high. But if they're perfectly fine and intact, um, then there is no benefit you're going to gain them other than getting a better CT scan. So this person had left-sided weakness, balance problems, speech problems, and they were healthy other than the aspirin. So, um, you know, other, and again, there's no evidence in neurosurgery, so others may wait a few days and just watch the person. But in this case, it turned out okay. We have a question in the chat. Okay, so the question is, uh, that's a very good question. In neurosurgery, this question always comes up. Are chronic alcohol users on automatic prophylaxis for seizures prior to intervention? Um, we don't have, short answer to your question, we don't have good evidence um, for seizure prophylaxis in subdurals in general. Um, uh, chronic subdurals, sorry. Um, if they present uh, with an acute traumatic brain injury and their GCS is uh, um, low, so it's not just a mild traumatic brain injury, um, then we say there's evidence in favor of seven days of seizure prophylaxis to prevent early seizure. There's no evidence on prolonged use of seizure prophylaxis to stop long-term seizure. Okay. Um, the, the other question is, would you discontinue medication if the patient is taking Coumadin? So discontinue the Coumadin, is that the question? Yes. Um, so um, we get this a lot, right, Taylor? Um, yes. So, so yes, um, brain pressure trumps cardiac stuff in the acute setting. So if there's brain pressure in the patient's comatose, you absolutely stop the Coumadin and you even reverse it. Um, but again, it's, it, a lot of these have, uh, are, you need an upfront and honest conversation with the family about what your concerns are. So if you reverse the Coumadin, uh, the INR, and you stop the Coumadin, there's a high chance for whatever they were on um, that may happen. So usually patients are on, let's say, Coumadin for atrial fibrillation or stroke prevention. And so there is a risk of um, getting a stroke if you're off of it. But that's why uh, for things like AFib, you follow the CHATS2 score. And I always involve a cardiologist to tell us, okay, how long is it safe to hold the aspirin, the Plavix, the Coumadin? If someone's on aspirin just for daily preventative purposes, I stop it and I ideally tell them to never go back on it and we can revisit it later and, and follow up scans if they're doing really well. But if they're on Coumadin, Plavix, other blood thinners, I stop it, I reverse it where I can and I get cardiology involved right away. And uh, so that we can have a chat about when is it, how long can we safely hold it? And they usually say as long as neurosurgery feels necessary, which is great, but sometimes not helpful because <laughs> I always feel like it's necessary to hold it forever, but uh, <laughs> we try to strike a balance. That's when having a great multidisciplinary approach and, and good connections with your colleagues and, and involving other teams with the care of these patients really comes into play. Um, and that's something that Dr. Mansuri is really good about and our whole entire team tries to be really good about is involving other services and, and speaking with them and kind of getting everybody on board to sort of make a group decision and, and come to a group consensus. Yeah, and you find out when you go into practice, uh, you can have the reflexive approach of just consulting everybody, which doesn't score you much points. But if you approach it like a collegial conversation, like friends and colleagues, everyone appreciates it. Hey, what's your thought on stopping the Coumadin for two weeks, four weeks? And I think that relationship works better than just reflexively consulting and never talking to the cardiologist on the end of, other end of the phone. And third and final case, 83-year-old male, had a fall three days ago. He's confused at baseline, but functional. Uh, when he comes to your ER, he's moving all four limbs. He's oriented to himself, but only giving yes and no answers. Does not obey, but he has his eyes open spontaneously. Who wants to take a shot at the GCS here? So orientation, it gives you hints on the verbal. Um, yes, no answers. They're not moaning incomprehensively. They're able to tell you where they are. They're not fully oriented to place and time. So that gives you a V4, not a perfect V5. Um, they're not obeying, but they're awake. So it's really hard to justify giving them a central rub. Um, so I just usually say that. And then eyes open spontaneously. So that gives you an E4. So we have the answer of uh, various answers, but E4, I'll give this M5, V4. So that's 13, correct. 
And of course, the species on aspirin too. Um, and they had done this scan in trauma. Um, CT scan on the left. Is this a subdural or epidural? Subdural. Good. I think everyone's going to dream about subdurals. Uh, <laughs> is it acute or chronic? Acute. Yeah. Is there a lot of midline shift? Not significant. We can measure it. Yeah, and I think this is one of those cases where like the age and the chronic brain atrophy has uh, played to this person's advantage. Um, certainly the bleed may be irritating the brain, but it's not causing a life-threatening uh, compression. You can even see, uh, this is not an official guideline, so please don't quote me, but you can even see the um, sulci are open. So not as much as the right, the other side, the left side of the brain, but they're relatively open. There's even some gaps there. So this is probably one of those that has bled, um, has like, bled acutely, but it's not giving the patient that much trouble. Um, but they're on aspirin. It's an acute subdural blood after all. You don't ignore this. This, this can be deadly. So this is one of those that I would repeat the scan closer to four hours rather than six hours, just for my own sake. And uh, we have um, an answer also about this one. That's an excellent answer. This is an axial cut that's starting to get into the cervical spine. And yes, that's the C1 vertebral body that looks like a koala. <laughs> and it's a fracture through here, here, and here. And um, we can get into that in future um, lectures on uh, spinal cord injury and spine fractures from trauma. So this is a Jeff Jefferson. Yeah, exactly. This is a Jefferson. <laughs> Brownie fracture. points. What's that? Brownie points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the classic Jefferson fracture is this four fracture lines. And they often refer to the C1 ring as like a pretzel. You can't really break a pretzel in one spot. So, and the mechanism is usually axial loading as shown in this picture here. But if, you know, if the patient turned in one direction or had a loading and flexion or loading and extension, the patterns may look different. And uh, sneak peek into the future lectures, if they have a, um, axial loading and extension, you can see the anterior arch is uh, broken and there's an odontoid here. So oftentimes you see the patient either break this or the odontoid or both. So that's very common uh, in young people, uh, motor vehicle collisions and in the elderly because they just fall down the steps, uh, unfortunately on their foreheads and extend their um, neck. So in this gentleman, we held the aspirin, uh, monitored him in the ICU. Um, so this was a mild TBI, GCS was 13. So there is no evidence for seizure prophylaxis. But if, the GC, uh, if this was a severe trauma, 100% would have the patient on um, seizure prophylaxis. The initial paper that came out was with Dilantin, but now we have IV Keppra. It's a much cleaner drug, better side effect profile, better controlled and less sensitive to other medications that you're taking. So I love Keppra. Um, we monitor the electrolytes because with any traumatic brain injury, you can have abnormalities of dose, which can cause, again, seizures. And the C1 fracture, what I didn't mention, we, we did an MRI to make sure the ligament is not ruptured, and it is not. And, you know, the, the, we look at the overhang of the C1 lateral mass on C2. It wasn't more than the guidelines, which is on CT 8.2 millimeters. <clears throat> so we manage them in a call, especially his age. This would be a huge undertaking to want to operate on him. So we try to manage it in a collar. And this is a picture of a collar. Whoever's interested in uh, appropriate application of a cervical spine collar and some of the evidence behind it, feel free to message us or email us. And Taylor has excellent handouts on this that we give to every patient on discharge. So, yeah. And then um, look at this. So on two-week follow-up, neurologically, he was exactly the same but you can see this has expanded. And this is another reason to follow them closely, even if in the acute period, they're fine and the bleed doesn't expand. Because in many people, as the acute blood um, becomes chronic, it liquefies and it actually expands and act, they can run into trouble. So you can see it has, as expected, liquefied, but it's really pushed the brain now and causing, you know, we could argue a little bit of a midline shift here. But he was clinically intact, 83 years old, baseline, some dementia, um, what are you trying to accomplish here? A better CT scan or to make him neurologically better? He hasn't changed. 
neurologically over the past two, three weeks. So what are you trying to improve? So in this case, we decided to watch him and look, it disappeared. Um, so it can do that with time. Yeah, supportive management was the question. Uh, supportive management, yes. And you can see even the C1 fracture. Look at that, it's healing so nicely. Posteriorly, we're starting to see ridges of bone form back here and the anterior parts are completely fixed despite that big gap that we had seen. So again, sometimes not operating is the best thing you can do for patients as a neurosurgeon. All right, any question? Yeah, I got a question for you. Um, do you ever use MRI when you're looking at TBI and why? Um, Taylor, you wanna take a crack at this? I'm sorry, well, I missed the last part of the question. Do you ever use MRI when looking at, um, I'm sorry, what? Uh, TBI, and why would you or would you not? Oh, um, yeah, so the only time um, that we really used an MRI for TBIs um, in our practice, one thing that we didn't talk about today is a, a DAI, which is a diffuse axonal injury, which is more of, just to be prognostic, the MRI is the most sensitive test for that particular TBI. Um, we use that sometimes. Um, occasionally you can see a DAI on CT, but typically we'll get an MRI for that. Um, more from a prognostic standpoint, um, we can also use those sometimes if we're, if we're concerned that the patient might have had a stroke or those sorts of things, or um, if we're concerned. So another time we may use it for a TBI is if we have a bleed where there's no traumatic mechanism and we're trying to decide, um, is it a cavernoma? Is it a vascular malformation? Could there perhaps be a tumor that bled underneath? Um, so we'll use it for that. So I shouldn't say that we don't often use it, um, but it's more in specific circumstances. For a patient that comes in um, in an acute situation with a subdural or those sorts of things, um, typically we rely mainly on CT scans. Is that kind of cover that, Dr. Mansuri, for the most part? Uh, absolutely. So, and that gets tricky because, um, you know, when you, so on an MRI, you can use a sequence that specifically looks for these punctate hemorrhages. So <clears throat> that's used for detecting DAI, diffuse axonal injury. Um, and usually you do that, and as Taylor said, to prognosticate, the patient's not really waking up, can't really figure out why. Um, uh, and then, um, but as part of your workup, you're trying to rule out seizures and the patient has like, you know, you're trying to do continuous EEG monitoring and the patient has these EEG electrodes on their head. Then you can't go down for an MRI because, you know, either artifact or metallic, the metal is not com compatible. So it's always that balance. But yeah, usually we get an EEG quick one just to see if there's any ongoing active seizure uh, going on that you can uh, address as part of the management. And then for the MRI to look at how extensive the injury is to find out why the patient's not waking up. Other times that you may do that is, you know, uh, going back to the original question of holding warfarin, patient is a high risk of stroke. And uh, typically the CHAT score tells you an annual risk of stroke, but doesn't tell you when it's going to happen. It could happen in the next two weeks, let's say. So you've held the uh, warfarin and you reversed it two weeks post-op. There's a little bit of subdural, <clears throat> but the patient uh, suddenly has a change in their uh, neurological status. And you can't figure out why. And so you do an MRI, which helps you find out, oh, they had a stroke from a clot from the heart because of the atrial fibrillation. So that's another setting that I would use it, but not other than that, uh, not in acute TBI. I had another Any other question. Oh, go ahead. Um, I was wondering in the situations where you are not proceeding with surgery, what would you say for both of you is your favorite aspect of the treatment with the patient. When you, say treatment, you want to go first? when you say treatment, do you mean actual intervention or the whatever decision you've had in the management? Well, I guess that's a good follow-up as well. What role do you play when it's not surgical? I know you were speaking about uh, working with the team members to decide, you know, if you're going to use a brace and so I guess if you can clarify in those times when you're not going through a surgery, do you have any role in their treatment other than just the decision? Yeah, I think, um, you know, our critical care colleagues are excellent to be in, in terms of being up to date on the evidence, but uh, I always like to be a contributing member to the team in terms of the latest evidence. And if they're, you know, stuck on whether we should start DVT um, prophylaxis or, you know, should we start the meds? Another part that I, I don't want to say I enjoy, but I think I can, we can make a difference is talking to the family because it's a very, 
although we see tons of these, this is a very traumatic event, right? Like oftentimes you don't experience multiple traumas in your family. So it's life altering. So the best thing we can do in these cases is to lay out all the facts. I like to go through the imaging with them, really explain it for them and really explain the challenges that we're facing and why we're choosing one decision over another. Um, so I think, and I think that makes a difference in terms of either setting their mind at ease or planning for the next steps. Um, so that's a part that I feel like we can make a difference. I personally really like um, kind of doing the overall differential diagnosis. And this is a little bit of a spinoff from TBIs. Um, but Dr. Mansuri and I had a patient in the clinic the other day um, who had some recent weight loss and um, was uh, had had some recent dental surgery and was having some trouble swallowing, um, just kind of some nonspecific back pain that just didn't seem to fit the profile, um, had been worked up by multiple other people prior to this. Um, but Dr. Mansuri was um, thorough enough that um, as a team between him and I in clinic that day, we sent her for um, a CT scan of her lungs. Um, and turns out she actually had metastatic lung cancer, which um, unfortunately, it's unfortunate for the patient, obviously, but um, thankfully, by looking at the overall picture, we were able to catch that. And um, that's one thing that I really, really enjoy neurosurgery. But then there's some moments too, where what I really like about our team and specifically um, working with Dr. Mansuri is we, we do look at the whole picture. Um, so when these patients aren't surgical, but they're still, you know, not responding as, as we would expect, instead of just being like, well, there's no surgery. Um, we tend to look at the whole picture. Um, and I really, I really enjoy that aspect because we really get to work on our differential diagnosis and, and our physical exam. And I, I really enjoy that aspect. Great. Thank you. That was, that was great. 